This Week in Startups is brought to you by Segment. Segment's startup program has exclusive deals with the best tools and resources to become a data expert. To see if you qualify for a free account worth up to $25,000, go to segment.com slash twist. LinkedIn. A business is only as strong as its people and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit toward your first job post. And Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the podcast we do here in San Francisco in the Silicon Valley 100 times a year. It's our 10th year of publishing. We'll have our 10th anniversary this spring, and we've done over 900 episodes. You can help the podcast in uh, three different ways. One, tell a friend about it. Two, go to Patreon and uh, do a search for This Week in Startups. You can join our new exclusive super fan group. You pay 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. You get the show three days, four days in advance without ads. And you get a custom RSS feed where we give you the shows early without advertising in them. That's kind of nice. We think about 1% of the audience cares about that. And uh, also, uh, you get to go to the front of the line for Ask Jason episodes, and we're figuring out Patreon and what the idea is there, but a lot of you asked, hey, can I support the show? So we decided we'd put that up there. 100% of the proceeds go into helping improve the show. Uh, also, you can write a review of the show on iTunes, and then most of all, tell a friend about the show. If you see a great episode, go ahead and uh, let your friends know about it. Also, thanks to the folks over at Podcast Notes, if you haven't seen that. There are another Patreon um yeah, Twitter handle, content producer. I don't know who does it, but Podcast Notes has been writing up some of our past episodes or current episodes and writing like their learnings from the episodes. And I really do appreciate that. So whoever the masked uh, writer is for Podcast Notes, thank you. And I've subscribed and uh, everybody on my team, everybody go subscribe and thank them for doing that. On the show, we like to teach you how to build a company and get to scale, how to come up with a great idea. Our founder today has built a company with 500 employees over the last, uh, since founding it in 2009. He's got his first decade under his belt with Cabbage. You've probably heard of Cabbage. If you haven't, they uh, help small businesses get loans, which they desperately need. Everybody complains. Banks don't give loans anymore. There's no way for me to fund my business. It's all or nothing. Everybody wants to be a unicorn and get venture or they can build off revenues and bootstrap, but what's in between? Well, hopefully we find out a little bit about that today. Uh, Rob Frowine is with us. Did I pronounce it right? You got it perfect. Frowine, nice. um, which if you didn't know, is mm-hmm. German. Did you know that? I, I think I did. I heard it, I heard it recently. And <laughs> it's four, it means? Happy wine. How did you know it means happy wine, correct? It was a, it was a guess. Very good, Rob. You led you the figured witness it well. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, tell us, when did you found Cabbage and why? So uh, found Cabbage uh, late 08, early 09. Uh, came up with the idea in 07. Uh, and uh, it's one of those ideas. I've had ideas my whole life, but you know, sometimes the good ideas keep nipping at your heels. Yeah. Uh, and it kept nipping at my heels. So uh, fall of 2008, I made a couple of phone calls, found a couple of great co-founders to, to start it with me. And Got the ball rolling. And what was the original idea? What was the thing that you were frustrated with in the world that kept nipping on your heels, as you say, the itch that you needed to scratch? Yeah, it, yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that. So so what I realized was that, so I was working with a company that was pulling down data from online marketplaces to identify counterfeit and fraudulent products sold online. So I had that sort of body of, of knowledge about these APIs that were out there being offered by a variety of companies. And I also was aware of the plate of small businesses that weren't able to get access to capital. And so I sort of just pushed those two ideas together and said, um, why not provide the original germ of the idea was providing loans to eBay sellers, if you can believe huh. that niche concept, which was I knew I could get access to data, and I knew that these small businesses really had no um, option to, to really help them grow. And you could get that data by just hitting the API yep. and saying, hey, give me your PayPal data, give me your eBay data, your seller data, and there's something in that data that would let you know this is a good person to give money to. They'll pay it back. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, it's funny. It was it was all about the fact that I wanted to access real time data for these small businesses, and I thought that would help us and and my co founders as well. That would help us understand how these small businesses would repay us. What I didn't appreciate at the time is all the collateral benefits that came a, that came along with getting access to online data. So a small business wants expansion capital, and they are willing to give you access to all of their books, all of their data. They, they do. Which seems fact, reasonable. It does seem reasonable. In fact, you know, most of the venture capitalists I went and talked with initially said, who's going to give you access to their data? Who would ever do that? And I said, business that needs a loan to grow their business. And yeah. by the way, it's not just for investment, but small businesses. And a lot of those that we serve are the retailers, the dry cleaners, the restaurants, the home service folks. Um, those folks, um, you know, don't, as you said, don't have access to capital. But they use QuickBooks. They use all these different services that allow us to understand yeah. how that business is being run. I would also assume that some of them don't even do their books. They do cash-based accounting. They get a certain amount of money in. They spend a certain amount of money. And they just look at their balance in their bank account. Can you tell from just a bank account that's a mess like that if it's a worthy loan? Yeah, actually, we can. So that's the, that is what we've been working on for the last 10 years. But obviously, I've spent a lot of time and a lot of transactions doing that, which is basically making sense of these disparate data sources and saying, what does that actually tell me about the business? Got it. What percentage of people who apply get a loan? So great question. Um, if, you're, if your business is doing at least $5,000 a month in revenue, which you know is a pretty low bar for yep. most small businesses or any business out there, we're about 75 or 80% of those customers get, get, uh, get qualified through Cabbage. <clears throat> what ratio of loan would a person who's got a, let's call it a healthy business, I guess, yeah, you sure. know, top 20% of that group, if they did a million dollars in revenue a year, what percentage of that would they be able to get in a loan if it was consistent? You know, they'd been, you had two or three years worth of data. Would sure. they be able to get a million dollar loan, a hundred thousand dollar and 10%, half of it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to measure that specifically, but typically about if you're if you're talking about a, a business that's robust, you know, usually one to two months of their of their revenue. Okay. So if they're making get... seventy five a month, hitting about yeah, a million sure. a year, they could get seventy five to one hundred fifty. Somewhere in that range, yeah. And How we go up. By the way, our top line is about two hundred and fifty thousand. How is it different than a line of credit with a bank? Well, it's funny. It's actually set up as a line. First of all, banks don't offer these businesses lines of credit, but we set up our system as a line of credit. So when we approve your business for that $100,000, you can take it all down, you can take down some portion of it, and you can come back because you have open to borrow. But the, the important thing is we stay connected to those data sources that we were just talking about. So we actually know how your business is performing, not just at the moment you originally uh, apply, but at every point thereafter. So now you've become <clears throat> a true partner. You've got we con have. consistent insight into what's in their bank account, what's in their basically accounting. And if they start to falter, what do you do? Because you'll so, have that early warning system, won't yeah, you? Yeah, and we do. And we, we now have 170,000 customers that are borrowed $6.5 billion. So we look at data every day. We pull down data from these data sources every day. And so if there's a challenge in the business, we have an ability to modulate the line. Uh -huh. So, but, but not just down, but also up. So uh -huh. if your business is actually improving, we'll increase the amount of capital that's available for your business. Um, if it's not, <clears throat> pardon me, if it's not um, improving, if it's, if it's not as healthy, we'll just manage it so that you don't have access to a line that you can't afford to repay. Got it. Yeah. So if everything craters, whatever, right. you know, they start building a uh, train station outside of your deli and you, you can't get access to it and the revenue goes down 90%, you can say, okay, the, the credit line will go from 100000 down to ten or something. Uh, yeah, we'll do that. That's not obviously the typical example. And we don't yo-yo lines for customers ah. because people need to rely on the amount of capital they have, right? They're, this is a line of credit that they're using for all sorts of purposes. All right. I have a stupid question, mm -hmm. as I often do on this podcast, all right. um, and I'm going to ask it here. We hear about the country putting trillions of dollars into stimulus, giving loans, ridiculous size loans, and bonds uh, being originated for people like Amazon or Apple and even Tesla, all taking down huge amounts of loans. And then we consistently hear that small businesses don't have access to those. 
Yet we also hear that our government officials say, and the statistics say, that small businesses are where all the job creation is. So when we get back from this quick break, I want you to explain to me why there is a huge disconnect between what our government is telling us, they're putting this massive stimulus into the world in order to make small businesses grow, and then small businesses consistently saying they can't get access to that capital when we get back on This Week in Startups. When you're building your startup, you have a ton of questions about your users and how they're using your product. Who are these people? How are they using it? And are you working on the right things? Many times I meet founders and they have 50 different features in their product and they don't know who's using what and when and how often. Well, that's what Segment helps you do. It helps you answer these critical questions so that you can put your dev resources, you can put your people, designers, etc., the management team, the sales team, you can get them all aligned by studying your user data and figuring out what to focus on. You can cut down on annoying integrations and just have your developers get back to work by using Segment. You just, boom, put it right into your product and it's easy to use. And they've recently launched a startup program. That's why they're here on This Week in Startups as a partner. And early stage startups can get access to a free Segment account worth up to, wait for it, 25 large, 25 dime skis, $25,000, complete with exclusive deals with the best tools for startups and resources to become a data expert. It's the ultimate analytics setup at a startup's favorite price. To see if you qualify for Segment's account worth up to $25,000 large, check out segment.com slash twist. S-E-G-M-E-N-T dot com slash twist. I mean, they got the name segment.com. That's a really good domain name. Segment.com slash twist. Get that uh, application in and see if you're going to get that $25,000 worth of segment. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. My guest today, Rob Frowine, and he is the co-founder and CEO of Cabbage, K-A-B-B-A-G-E. Um, it's cabbage.com, I assume. You got it. Yep. And you're Cabbage Rob. <laughs> Twitter on the Twitter. Handle, yes. There's your Twitter handle. Um, how did you come up with the name Cabbage, by the way? That was uh, sort of several nights sitting uh, at a bar uh, trying to come up with a name with, with three other people. And, you know, we went through every possible food. Got Cabbage it. with a K.com was 1200 bucks. Cabbage with a C.com was 75000 Great. We had no money. Do you own so Cabbage with a C now? And we do redirect now. it. And yes. you redirect. And so we you actually, fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually paid less now than we then it was available back then interesting yeah well done hey when i left you uh before the break there i asked you about this weird disconnect because i hear all the time uh from people oh small businesses can't get loans but then we hear about this crazy stimulus what's the disconnect why can't we get or, or is is there a disconnect am i wrong are small businesses able to just go into a bank and get a loan pretty easily these days what's the story you know it, it it's Look, if you have a super high personal credit score and you go into a bank, you can get a loan, but they're going to leverage your personal credit um, to do that. So you're going to put your house on the line. Oh. Um, you're going to take personal liability for it. So they're not looking at the business. And the problem is banks aren't set up to understand you know, how a small business operates. When they talk about small business, even when the government talks about small business, they're talking about, okay, between 10 and 50 million in top line revenue. That's they're small. Not, yeah. That's small to them. Right. So they don't even they they don't even think of the businesses we serve as as actual businesses many times. Yeah, that's interesting. So small businesses under 10 million in revenue or in their first year under a million in revenue. Yep. What are their choices right now? So, it, you know, the good news is the choices are expanding. There are more companies that are out there now serving small businesses, um, not not just us. It, you know, lots of other companies have, have sort of entered the space. Um, but it's still a arduous process for the most part. It's still yeah. paper intensive, time intensive. And the things that we always say is the, the precious resource that small businesses don't have and small business owners is time. Mm. You know, the small business owner is running the cash register, they're stocking the yeah, back no. room, they're, you know, bringing the customers in the door, they're doing all these things. And by the way, they're really good at the skill or craft that brought them into that small business. Yeah. They're not great at managing their cash flow. So right. that's the issue. Got it. What's the average size of a loan? Our average loan, actually, we set up as a line of credit, as I mentioned, and so average line of credit is like twenty to twenty five thousand. Average loan is about seven thousand dollars. That's but, it. Yeah, wow. but businesses borrow four, five, six times a year. They keep coming back again and again. Got it. Yeah. Why would they do this with you as opposed to at a bank? 
like a, a well, Bank of America. It's just Bank it's, of America or well, whatever, like whatever bank. No, no, they I use. get it. I get yeah. it. No, no, it's it's uh, they can't really get capital ah. from those banks. Those banks are not set up to serve them. Mm. They can go. They can spend eight weeks, and they'll often, I would say, nine out of ten times, get a no at Got the it. end of that process. How long do you take to turn it around? Because I guess that's the key. Because there's that mortgage company, what is it, Quicken Mortgages, I guess. Their guarantee is they're going to get you the mortgage and they're going to turn it around really quick. Is that your value proposition? We're going to turn it around quick? Well, so it's you land on our site, give us access to data. We make a decision, approve, and ship money within six or seven minutes on average. Minutes? Minutes. When you said six or seven, I was waiting for you to say hours the, or days. Hours or days, no minutes. And I would have been impressed with six or seven hours. I would well, have been I'm, here like, to, I'm here to exceed your expectations. Six to seven minutes? <laughs> yes. So- because it's impossible to fake your bank account information at You're right. Bank of America yep. or other places. Whereas if people fill out a loan application, like Donald Trump did apparently at the uh, Michael Cohen hearings, you can put whatever <laughs> you want on those statements and Deutsche Bank is going to look at it and go, okay, sounds good. Here's a billion. Yeah, no, look, it, you're you're absolutely right. and But I, I wouldn't assume that most people who are filling out the applications are trying to defraud the institution, I'm which like I'm not president. suggesting you're, you're saying that's the case. But it's great getting third-party validated information that's yeah. connected by our customer and stays connected. It's, to me, you know, these banks have come up with a series of requests of information that were developed, you know, 70 years ago. Mm. And they're still asking for the same information today. Yeah, you know, why, why do it that way? Yeah, why are they so incompetent? <laughs> um, you know what? It's uh, you know it's funny. We we partner with a lot of banks as well in in, in Europe and other places, and it, it's just you know your DNA is your DNA. I think sometimes, yeah. and and that's their DNA. Um, for us, our DNA is data and technology and automation. Mm. So you know, for us, when Catherine Petrelli is my co-founder and I were trying to come up with the product, we go, of course it's a line of credit. Of course it's automated. Like. If there's another company doing this out there right now, it's got. I'm sure it's going to be automated in, and in minutes. Right. Right. Because no. you, one thing that really helps, I found that when you start a business, is complete naivete about the industry. Right. In some ways, not being a naive person, but not going in with knowing what the existing products are. Because when you do that, you end up building a slightly better product. Right. Right. For me, we were just sort of going, okay, like, what should it be? Mm. And that was a really helpful process to go through. It's interesting you bring that up. I think this is a uh, piece of wisdom that is not um, obvious. So when Building you're investing, everybody slight... says, what's the person's expertise? Do they have domain expertise? Yep. How deep are they in the space? And it's like, by the way, the people who built Amazon did not work at Walmart. If they did, they would have built a building that's 10% more alluring than a Walmart. Yeah. Not a difficult task. Um, instead, they just decided, hey, can we get everything to everybody in two days for free? Right. And then if you look at Uber, the same thing. Like, they didn't run a cab company before they started right. Uber. They they took cabs. It's fresh yeah. eyes on the product. Fre fresh eyes on the problem. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's starting with a completely different perspective. It doesn't hurt to have. So Catherine had plenty of domain expertise, not in small business lending, but she understood credit and payments, mm. which was really important, but she didn't know small business lending. I was a former lawyer and dabbler in a million different businesses. And so we just took a completely different perspective on it. Completely and different perspective. It does. When people see this kind of loan in six minutes, the first thing that I think comes to mind with some people is too good to be true. It's going to be predatory or all these business loans are like payday, predatory yeah. loans. What are the rates? And then how do you determine the rates? Are there originating costs? So if I want to, let's just say, in the example of your average $20,000 line of credit, what do I pay for that? Sure. Well, well first of all, there's, there's no origination fee. Okay. You're only paying on the capital you actually borrow. Got it. And that's important. So it's not like we give you 20000 you take five, and we charge you on twenty. So there's no maintenance fee, application fee, availability fee, or any of that stuff. And again, I attribute that mostly to our own naivete in the beginning. We just mm -hmm. didn't think there should be fees. That didn't make sense. So only pay for the cash that's out there. Our rates are divided up by risk tier, as okay. you might imagine. So we do risk-based pricing. And it starts as low as like literally a handful of percent, 1.25% for a month. Um, and then it goes up from there. So the, the fees range from 1.25% um, 
um, up to three or four percent in a given month, um, and it depends on the period so of time. So yearly, you pay it that back. would be. So our average, our average rate is in the mid thirties, which um, that's high, right? It's like credit card kind of level. It, it well, yes, but it, it's like credit card. I won't say it's high. What I will say is. Um, we have APRs that range down to the single digit percents, so five or six percent, and then up per year. Uh, per year. Per year. Yeah. APR. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, and then it, and then it just it also realized that a lot of these loans are short term loans. So it that compression of time makes it appear that the APR is a little bit higher than than the actual cost. So most of our customers, when they're looking at it, they look at what's my out of pocket dollars that I'm going to be spending on this. I've got to purchase a thousand dollars of inventory. I'm going to sell that thousand dollars of inventory over the over the next month. Um, so I'm going to generate two thousand bucks. I'm going to pay thirty bucks for that thousand dollars of incremental it. revenue. Yeah, because they're a small so, business. It's not like a venture based business where they're like, I'm going to take down a hundred. Those 000. are predatory rates. <laughs> <laughs> shh, shh, not predatory. <laughs> Just no, joking. High risk. Like, well, actually, it is actually a really valid discussion. I think because high risk. The risk level for venture based startups is. Much higher than small businesses, I think. The small businesses, like they may never become Ubers or unicorns, but they also may consistently make money. And you know, yeah, there's a there's a, a floor to it. But they're the average time they will keep it open is a couple of months, I guess. So they keep the 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 line stays open for them. The for a particular loan, it's oh. either a six or a twelve month loan for the most part. So they're paying it off in maybe four or five months for the six and yeah. 10 or 11 they, for can the they 12. pay down early, and or do they have to pay the total interest if they pay? No, um, the they only pay for the time it's out. So there's a lot of there are some other lenders in the space that they quote you a rate up front, yeah. and they say you know you can pay it back in a day or you can pay it back in six months. That's the amount of money we're getting paid. For us, it's divided by month. What are you so talking about? On deck? Back. Is that your big competitor? On deck? Um, in the lending space, yeah, that's our. That's, or do they have to pay a, the total uh, interest? That's a company that you know we're often compared to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there's always like a couple of players in the space. Um, what do you think about equity crowdfunding and some of these things? Because I think a lot of small businesses and a lot of people who maybe loan to them might like to have equity in them at some point. Have you ever, it must have come up inside your company sure. of like, hey, we got $6.5 billion out here. Maybe we convert the top 500 million to equity in those companies and have some kind of ownership in them and upside. What are your thoughts on that? So first of all, I think uh, equity crowdfunding, I, I, I think it's great. I'm, uh, um, I think some of those platforms have done fantastic. It, it's a little bit more complicated when we're looking at our client base because our client base is really the bread and butter. They're the literally the restaurants, the dry cleaners. You know, they're the folks that come in and fish, fix your dishwasher. Um, equity in those businesses is a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt, we have, you know, some companies that are technology startups, but Remember, we're we're you know we did we I think yesterday we sir we provided like seventeen hundred businesses with loans yesterday alone. Wow! Um, and you know so we're dealing at such a such a scale that it's complicated to do the equity piece. But there are certainly businesses out there that we funded that 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 might be appropriate for. All right. When we get back from this quick break, I want to talk to you about people who default and how you deal with that. And how do you manage? Sure people who don't pay it back when we get back on This Week in Startups. Have you tried to hire somebody lately? It is bonkers out there. It is so hard to find somebody because unemployment is so low and the top people have so many options, let alone the fact that a lot of people want to like work part-time or four days a week or from home. But there's all these great candidates out there who are passive job searchers. What do I mean by passive job searchers? Well, these are people who are hanging out on LinkedIn and they're, you know, maybe talking to friends or doing in-mail, updating their feed, reading news, all on LinkedIn, which is one of the world's largest social networks, as you know, and the largest one for business, clearly. Well, what if those people who are not looking, the passive job searchers, saw your opportunity? Well, they might say, hmm, I like my job. But I think I'll love that job working for JCal at launch. That's exactly what happened. That's how we got Sir Charles, our new director, for our studio position here. We received 68 candidates in only two weeks by posting to LinkedIn jobs. And I'm going to give you 50 bucks right now. I'm going to give you a 50 just by going to LinkedIn.com slash twist. LinkedIn.com, you know that. It's already in your URL. It's in your bookmarks because you're on LinkedIn multiple times a week, maybe a day like me. 
And if you go to LinkedIn.com and just put slash TWIST, you get 50 bucks right now, 50 beans. Go grab it and you will find extremely high qualified candidates. We spent, listen to this punchline, $140 to find Charles. If we had hired a headhunter or we're posting on other websites, it would have been so arduous. Instead, it was easy. And the same thing, we, we have an office now in Toronto. We were looking for people up there. We found this amazing candidate, Maureen, who's been doing an incredible job for us. And when we posted, LinkedIn auto-populated our posting with some candidates. We started reaching out to them and we're like, who is this superstar? Boom, got him on the team. So once again, LinkedIn saved the day for me, J. Cal. It's just brilliant. LinkedIn has been building and building for over a decade. And now the benefit is here. The benefit is you can find the best people, especially if you're a great company and you take the time to write a good ad and put it on LinkedIn Jobs. Again, 50 bucks, linkedin.com slash twist. LinkedIn.com slash twist. I use it. I love it. I love reading the ad for them because I get excited about finding talented people to work on our team. Okay. Speaking of talented people, let's get back to this episode. Rob Froine is with us. He's the co-founder and CEO of Cabbage. Not public. Not public. But raised $250 million from SoftBank Vision Fund. Or SoftBank. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's, we're, we're a vision fund. Your yeah, vision fund. We're now in the vision fund, yeah, that's correct. Uh, that's a big size check. How did that go down? <laughs> How did that go down? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. They used to have a, um, a venture arm called SoftBank Capital who did um, our D round, actually. Ah. And so we had relationships there. And uh, so, and we also, they've been, they were tracking us for a couple of years, mm. you know, I think as part of that. But um, great experience, great, great group. So... They came into the space with a very large checkbook. The criticism has been maybe running up valuations or overfunding companies. As the CEO, that two hundred fifty million, I'm assuming, is is that more than you raised previously to that date in total? What did you raise before you took down the two fifty? That's a really good question. I think we had raised. Um, I think we had raised like. 250 or 230 or something Five. like that. So, yeah. so it was around all previous funding. similar, similar, yeah. What do you think of that criticism slash concern in the marketplace and how do you deal with it as the CEO? You get a $250 million infusion. I assume you guys were close to profitable or you were in spitting zone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, no, our you lending business down. is profitable, yep. Oh, great. So. so how do you deal with sitting there with $250 million in the bank? So I think there's a couple things. One is obviously- Without I can getting distracted, right? I mean- it seems distracting. Uh, you know, I, I, I think, I think what I, so I can't really speak for the Vision Fund and, and what they're doing. I can tell you from my perspective, you know, what my vision for the where I think the company was and I, where I think it still is. It's beauty. We'd built a pretty large business already, hmm. um, but I still felt like we were at the infancy of the opportunity. And so, as a company that's a mature company, and you're at the infancy of the opportunity, you can you know, go public and you're no longer at the infancy of the opportunity mm. because you can't pursue the rest of that opportunity often. Got it. Or you can raise more capital, a meaningful amount of capital that allows you to execute on that vision. Um, and so I'm, that's what I'm exciting. And I have to tell you, you know, since that investment round, our ability to innovate and create and produce and put out new products and services for our customers has been fantastic. Why? Um, just because we we have the support to be able to do that, Got it. Um, so we've um, you know recently um, partnered with Alibaba.com. So we actually are checkout finance for customers who source products through that marketplace. U.S. Ah. customers who source products they can check out with Cabbage. Um, we have other relationships um, that we put together. We've also announced and we've launched in pilot a payment acceptance, um, which is similar to what Square and PayPal do. Ah. Um, but for our customers um, and the customers we're bringing on, and we're working on other products and services, our view is not to think of ourselves as a lender, but to really think about our customers who are borrowing and why they're actually borrowing. And the reason they're doing it is because one of two reasons, either they have volatility in their cash flow cycle or they want to invest in new opportunities. Right. Um, and so now that we look at it through that lens, we say, well, how else can we support those customers yeah. to, to do that? And Thanks to you know our investors, um, you know we're able to pursue that vision and really put the focus squarely on the customer. It's fascinating because you went from having to run the business, I assume, 
maybe looking, you know, at a quarterly kind of cadence, you know, as a venture company is wont to do. But when you take a $250 million infusion, now you start thinking in what, five, 10 years? Yeah, I think I, I think I do two things. One is I think about it in minute increments because I watch our volume constantly. Got it. Um, and then the other thing is I go, you know, what do we want to be when we're, you know, 10 years from now? And, it, and it's funny because years ago, I had a meeting with a guy named Tom Stafford. Do you know Tom? With no. DS, D, he's at DST. With, I know DST, there. yes, of course. Right? I know so, Yuri. Milner. You know Yuri. So Tom's his partner is based in, and I haven't, I haven't talked about Tom in this context, but I was in his office in a meeting like five years ago, and he says to me... Um, so what's your vision? Well, like, what's your five or 10 year vision for cabbage? Yeah. And I was like, uh, I literally stammered and I was like more, better, you know, like <laughs> that was like my vision. And yeah. I kind of realized at that moment, like that's not a vision. Right. Right. So, you know, I sort of went on this discovery since then to say, you know, who do we want to be when we grow up? What do we want to represent? How are we going to, you know, think about our customers? And I think it was you know, sort of that realization mm. um, that, that, that you know, sort of took us through that path and really helped through, you know, the soft bank round, et cetera. See, this is the thing I think is brilliant about the Vision Fund. Um, it reminds me a lot of when DST came in and everybody was like, oh, Yuri Milner is just splashing cash around. He's going to lose all his money. He's paying twice as the valuation of everybody else, yada, yada, yada. He wound up being the smartest guy in the room, not the stupidest. Mm -hmm. Like literally people were like, Yuri Milner's the stupidest guy in the room. He's literally marking up our investments 2x right. six months later. What a dope. And it's like the guy like put a billion dollars into Facebook when it was at what, five or 10? Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah, that turns out to be a good investment. Yeah, I think it worked out, right? And <laughs> the Vision Fund now, people think, oh, they're just giving $250 million to startups that will then collapse like early stage. Here's an example of a 10 year startup with 500 employees, which means if you have 500 employees, you know, you got 100, what, or 50 to 100 million dollar payroll a year. This is no joke. This is a, which means you have to be making you know, nine figures already in revenue, correct? Correct, yeah. But you had that choice. Go public, get the bankers breathing down your throat, want to take you public, which is the dream of all founders, even if they won't say it is, <laughs> ring that bell, or push back the IPO for a couple of years and build quietly and privately. That was your choice, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And it's it's funny, you, you mentioned that, that dream of founders. I have to admit that when I started the company, even when I was growing up, the lore of starting a company and being able to take it public was like exciting and Everything. you thought about it. It was like really cool. And it's funny, now that I've done this business for this number of years, I don't like think about I like it's not like the yeah. thing that make, gets me excited anymore. Right. Right. It it now I'm like I, I understand the money raising thing and I realize it's just a fundraising event and I realize I've seen a bunch of my friends go through it and the challenges yeah. associated with it. And you end up with just you you learn. You get yeah. older and you learn. Yeah, it's interesting. I think when we grew up, you just see that as being the corollary with success. You're right. In 100% of cases, whether it was Microsoft or it was Apple or it was Cisco, I'm assuming like uh, you grew up in the 80s maybe, like me, <laughs> yeah. born 1970, 75? Uh, just before 70. 68? 68, yeah. Okay, I'm 1970, so you grew up, you, you have go. first computer, Commerce 64, TRS yeah. 80, what? Oh, yeah, no, exactly. Commodore 64? Yeah, yeah. All right. So you have the, ta you have the tape drive? Um, uh, yes. I can You know, you, you remember better than me. <laughs> the tape drive was the best. It's like you want to load yep. a game, put no, the tape know, in, and let it read, come back well, in know, half an hour. I also remember when I had my first, you know, I, I got my um, my first um, desktop from a, uh, from a chop shop, basically. <laughs> and so I remember inserting, I was so excited, I added like 250 megs of of memory into it you know yeah long time ago and i thought i'll never run out you no, know at this point yeah, forever yeah uh my favorite it story was when i was working in it at uh, amnesty international i have oh, yeah. two stories so that was my big internship i was uh, big into human rights and still am and um i was on the phone with a woman in a you know foreign country who was one of the activists who would coordinate and i said okay uh, suppress the any key and uh, we'll install the software. And she says, I don't see it. I said, no, no, just press any key. <laughs> she goes, I can't find the any key. I have enter, I have cap locks, I have shift, I have control. And I was like, oh, click the key of your choice, any one of the keys. She goes, well, why didn't you say that? Why doesn't it say that? And I was like, that is a good point. Yeah. And the yeah, other best one was somebody was installing their software themselves again. 
Uh, they were on another floor of the building. And I said, okay, well, just take the, the floppy disk out of the case and put it in there. It's not working. It's not working. I said, all right, come up after lunch. I come up after lunch. She had taken the five and a half inch floppy out of the sheath and then opened the floppy itself. Wow. Which takes a little bit of effort, like to rip it open and pull the me media out of it and yeah. stuck it in the drive yeah, so and it wasn't working. And I was like, well, that works out. Yeah. Um, Did you ever see the YouTube, the sales versus IT? No. You, you have to look that up. Sales v. It's, IT. I'm on sales it. v. IT. It's like, it's every, it's worth Good, every one it of its like 10 or 12 minutes. It is incredible. Um, and it's, I, I, is I it literally those stories? It's those. Yeah. It's basically somebody is having a problem with their yeah. um, computer and they call down to IT for it. So it's, it's fantastic. Uh, hey, with the uh, last day on the Vision Fund, before they, uh, when they launched it, everybody knew like, it's the uh, Saudi money. Then uh, the Saudis go and kill a journalist in cold blood. Now, all of a sudden, Silicon Valley and everybody's a little bit concerned. Should they take this money now? How do you think about it? Are you concerned so, about uh, where the money comes from? Huh. Well, so look, look, this is the the way I view it is that um, one of the things I'm really proud of is the number of small businesses we've helped. Yeah. 170,000 small businesses in the U.S., um, you know, who, you know, the, the amount that's been one of the most, um, that's been the mo the best part of this journey has been all the positive feedback. And so I, when I look at the 250 million that was invested from SoftBank and the hundred, couple hundred million yeah. that was invested before, that's really been invested into U.S. small businesses and driving that economy. And that's really what yeah. I'm, what I'm focused on. It is a conundrum. I'm a, obviously an investor in Uber and they took three and a half million directly from the Saudis before the vision fund existed. And I was like having the human rights background. I was like, ah, they don't let women drive in that country. They torture people in that country. Like, are we really taking that money? And so was a conundrum for me too, but it's going to good work, I guess. It's going to good work. And, um, you know, and I, you know, and I've, we built a great relationship with SoftBank. Yeah. Um, good folks who are focused on solving some of the, you know, biggest crises that are happening in the world yeah. um, through technology. And I, so I'm a big fan and, and big uh, supporter of, of the types of companies they're investing in. Yeah. It's a challenge for our industry. We have to think about it deeply, like engaging, because engagement of other countries can lead to good things. Like, do right. we engage with China or not? And then... How, what is their human rights track record? Right. Hey, before we went to the break, uh, moving on from uncomfortable topics, but we have to bring them <laughs> up. Uh, I talked to you, another uncomfortable uh, topic, I guess, bad loans. Bad loans. You don't take a lien against people's houses like no. a bank might. So when Joe's Pizzeria goes belly up and you loan them 50000 and you were, as it were, the person who caught the knife. We get a lot of pizza. You no, get a I'm lot kidding. of pizza dough. You get a pizza <laughs> oven. <laughs> what do you do, and how often does that happen? So uh, it a actually happens um, many fewer times than you'd imagine. So yeah. our our default rates are, um, you know, five percent. You know, okay. give or take of the number of that you originate or the dollar amount. I guess essentially, the same. essentially the same, pretty much the same. And um, and you know, for those, we actually have a collections department. And the nice thing is we're connected in data, mm -hmm. right? So you'd be amazed at how many customers who have a challenge paying us back stay connected to our, let us stay connected to their data sources. Right. So we actually understand if they're having a legitimate issue in their business ah. or they're not paying us back because they don't want to pay us back. That's interesting. Um, and you know, biz there's businesses suffer all the time um, and we, appreciate that we understand that so we really just try to work out the relationship with them um, we don't go hardcore or anything along those lines yeah. with them um, customers who have chosen not to pay us back because they've chosen not to pay us back well that's um, different yeah then we then we have a you know then we go through a more you know legal process with them but yeah. you know there we've had look there are customers that have been affected by hurricanes uh, floods fires hmm. um, you know government shutdowns all these things have happened, and, and it's not anything I would have imagined when we started the business that this would be something that we'd have to actively think about. But you know, these are folks that are going through real stress, or we've had plenty of customers who've had you know, a death of the spouse, um, a terminal illness of a child. Hmm. You know, these are things you know, our heart goes out, and we, you know, we try to figure out how to make, you know, make cabbage not part of the problem, but really part of the solution. 
uh, you did a great survey on financial stress in small businesses. You polled 500 entrepreneurs, and we're going to reveal the results of that survey when we get back. And also, I look at your business, and I think, wow, you got that $250 million. I wonder if you're going to launch like checking and banking and all that kind of stuff, because that would seem like then you would have the full picture, and they would want to, if they trust you to give the loan, you could work backwards and just be a full-on bank. So is Cabbage going to become a full-on bank? You're going to answer that question when we get back on This Week in Startups. It's time for you to turn your great idea, perhaps even your startup idea, into a website. What are you going to do? You're going to use Squarespace because you need a beautiful website with incredible functionality from blogging to e-commerce, and you want everybody on the team to be able to quickly edit and update the website, and you want to get a great price. Whether you're trying to sell products or services or promote an online business or maybe a physical real-world business, maybe you're doing an event that we do a lot of events or a special project, bing, bang, boom, you can get your Squarespace website up and running immediately with their beautiful templates that are customizable, powerful e-commerce functionality, and it's all optimized for mobile, tablet. You make it, it looks beautiful in all different screen sizes. And you get analytics, plus you can buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. You may have seen IU, I did uh, angel.university and founder.university using Squarespace. It's free, it's secure, and 24-7 award-winning customer support. So here is your call to action. I want you to visit squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, just use that offer code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I love Squarespace. They've been a credible supporter of this podcast. And every month, every quarter, week in, week out, they're delivering new features. This is one of the great things about cloud software and the, and the movement Squarespace just keeps listening to those customers and adding new features, and then you can just see it in the product and the functionality. And the price stays the same, and the value goes up. That's efficiency. That's what entrepreneurship is about, building a better mousetrap, and that better mousetrap is Squarespace. So go ahead and visit squarespace.com. Use the promo code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase. Okay, let's get back to this amazing website. I'm sorry, Mason Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. Rob Froan is with us. Go check out Cabbage.com, follow Cabbage Inc. on the Twitter, and let's talk a little bit about the product extension. Sure. It makes total sense for me for you to have checking and savings since you're already doing the line of credit. Do you provide those today, or are you thinking about that? So we don't provide deposit um, or any sort of savings or anything like that today, but we have announced that um, we are getting into payment acceptance. Um, okay. So... We're doing that. That'd so, be like Square's business? Correct. Oh, wow. um, yum, and yum. what's that? I said yum yum. <laughs> so does that mean you have a POS or a little yep. device or something? Both both uh, oh, both wow. electronic and uh, you know, both for online and and offline. So that's that's part one. We also have some bill pay products that are out there. Um, and I did a talk like a year ago and it was like they're just not that into you. Hmm. Um, and and the concept um, is that you might think you're in a relationship with your customers, but your your customers actually think like they're in a relationship with you. Right. Right. And you might- You could theory. just be a crazy stalker. <laughs> you think you're in a deep relationship <laughs> with them, when in fact, they're not. They're not. But yeah. you know, it's really, it's an important question because I think a lot of people think about product extension, but you, do you have implicit permission from the customer to actually mm -hmm. offer another product or service? Right. And look, we believe we do because we How? have a strong brand. How do you know brand. that? Yeah. How do we know that? Yeah. Well, you don't know that until you try, right? Okay. But but we know we have a strong brand recognized by a third of all small businesses out there. We know that we have a lot of customers that have huge repeat business with us, 15 or 20 loans over three to four years. Um, so we have regular positive interaction with the customers. Um, and we have a huge amount. Can I say shitload? Shitload, sure. Shit -ton. Shitload, shit ton, shit ton of data. Uh, you know, about our customers that, you know, help us understand what their needs and wants are. Um, so it puts us in great position to be able to offer other products and services that make sense for them. Uh, and credit I Credit card, cabbage credit card. We do have a card. You do have a card. We do have a card yeah. already. Um, but I do think about, and then I think about the problem that our customers have, which is managing cash flow. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think, look, we're in a unique position. We see the money coming in and we see the money going out. We see the money at rest. Right. And we can do a better job if we help them Uh, in lots of those different areas or at least have insight into those areas. What do you think about this factoring? I I hear a lot of like my my startup founders who I invest in companies say, oh, we're going to factor our receivables. And I'm like- what are our receivables? How, mu- how much are our receivables exactly? You've got a million in venture funding in the bank, yep. and you've only got like, I don't know, $250,000 in outstanding AR. Why would you factor? Yeah, it's, it seems, well, you know what? I think factoring is like an old school term. I, uh, I do think the things that make sense are you know some of the products that are out there that allow small businesses and independent contractors to get paid immediately, mm-hmm. instant instant payment for those yeah. customers. I do think because we have unique insight into um, the inflow of capital uh, or revenue coming for those customers, we can give them capital in advance of when they actually expect it with confidence that they're going to get that capital and will be able to repay us. Because you see the invoices. We see the invoice. We, yes, we see Pardon the invoice me. and we see the history. Bless you. Yeah, sorry about that. It's the first time I've ever seen the show. So yeah. I'm a German last name. I got to say Gesundheit. Gesundheit. Um, <laughs> I got a great place with Spätzl. Spätzl. I got, nice. I, you into the Spätzl? Yeah. I introduced my daughter to the Spätzl. Yeah. She's gone bonkers for Spätzl. This huh. is a great, great place in San Mateo. That's like a beer house. Wow. Uh, and uh, so next time you're on the way to the airport. All right. You stop by San Mateo. Just look up German beer house. It's, I forgot the name of it, but they have pretzels they make. All right, Spätzl so. and uh, what do they call it? Schnitzel. Yeah. Schnitzel. We've got oh, a little schnitzel, schnitzel going on. Schnitzel there. is you know veal or chicken schnitzel. Yeah, chi- chicken yeah, schnitzel yeah. Okay. Uh, with the with the spätzle and the pretzel. Well, oh, that's some special. <laughs> that's some good living right there. Wow, you're rhyming. It's like Am a I? rap. It's like a it's rap. A rap, absolutely. You said sh- schnitzel, pretzel. Schn- yeah. It's <laughs> um, special. You did this uh, survey. <laughs> Uh, poll 500 entrepreneurs who've run successful companies for an average of 10 years. Majority don't pay themselves for multiple consecutive months to control cash flow in the biz. Brutal. It's got really a, brutal. Yeah. That works well with the spouse. I'm not going to take a salary for three months. That's an interesting conversation with my wife. Uh, 26% have gone two to six months without paying themselves. My own. Another 25% for going more than six months without a paycheck. 63% said they regularly stress or have anxiety due to cash flow concerns. 35% often lose sleep or have difficulty sleeping. That seems low to me. 42% sacrifice much of their social life and personal hobbies. 30% they have, say their family life suffers. And that really it's, is- It's the, a real billboard for starting a business, isn't it? Absolutely. If you'd like to suffer from anxiety yes. and not be able to sleep and have 32%- It almost sounds like a prescription like yeah. caveat at the end of a prescription ad. I think we should, yes, exactly. T- be- taking entrepreneurialism can result in a 32% chance of hating your life. Some people get diarrhea or have 32% say their family life suffers. It's brutal. Why do uh, people do this? Yeah, you know, it's, why do we do this survey, Paul? I don't, I don't. No, it's good it's, for people to know. I think it's good for people to recognize like, how stressful it is and it, that having a, a, a little bit of a safety net so critical. It, it is. And, and let me tell you, I, I wasn't one of the respondents to the survey, but I suffered through, every, and it wasn't with cabbage, it was before cabbage, I, and I also with cabbage, but yeah, you I were, suffered you were through a all of it. Caller. Yeah. People don't know this about you. Oh, you, gosh, you, you that's in there the too? I got, the, I got all the notes. Wow. Holy moly. How'd you come up with that idea? <laughs> well, that was actually my buddy's idea. He had the truck. So you had a truck. So you had to have the had truck. you had no ability to be gainfully employed. So I was like, like I was like nineteen years 19, old. Nineteen, I was starting uh, By the way, my first magazine. All right, what well, are you talking about? I probably made more money hauling junk. Probably did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you probably did. That seems like hard labor. It was. Junk. It was. You know, you learn from those types of jobs. Those are those are good jobs to have. Yeah. Uh, somebody in your company got five hundred people last year came to you, I'm sure, and said, "Hey, boss, I need to talk to you about cryptocurrency." Okay. This is going to change everything. What insane ideas did your people or external people bring you? And how do you think about imaginary money? So uh, we actually had a hackathon a couple of years ago, and somebody wanted to be able to transmit funds you know, in crypto mm. and be able to receive payments. Really hard to do that when you're taking down huge facilities from Wall Street firms. Yeah. Um, so, so we didn't end up doing that. So we... You know, in terms of distributed ledger, um, so I'll so I'll take it a step back. I th- I think crypto 
and distributed ledger have a, a lot of opportunity within the capital market side of our business in terms of pulling together funds um, for investing into into small businesses through the loans that we do. I think the other place is um, it makes a lot of sense in in sort of our deposit base. Um, it's hard to it's hard to describe and it, it won't translate well to to an interview format. But I'm a big believer in in distributed ledger technology um, right. and blockchain. Um, crypto, you Why? know, has Why? its what place. What do you like about it so much? This this distributed ledger, um, speed, I, efficiency, what? Uh, speed, not necessarily. No, it's not that fast. <clears throat> no, it's not. Um, I, I think it gives us an opportunity to s- sort of manage information and manage money in a in a much more efficient way over time. And so, um, I especially see it for a company like ours, where we could do something really interesting um, in pulling together money for that we use in our capital markets to lend back to our businesses, but still be able to maintain you know, the, both the accounts and the volatility within accounts um, for individual customers. The $6.5 billion you've uh, originated, yep. whose money is that? The governments, other banks? Uh, not do you the governments. Do, not the governments. Not the governments. Yeah. So, it's, uh, so we put together ABS facilities, asset-backed securitization vehicles, mm-hmm. um, and those are invested in by banks, insurance companies, pension funds, you mm-hmm. name it. Um, they do that. We also have warehouse facilities and, and corporate uh, facilities as well. Got it. So people who are on large chunks of capital yep. want to put some in a, you know, with something that would make a higher interest rate, even though it's maybe got a little more defaults. Um, yeah. And, and by the way, we, we you know, sort of promise a return. And got so it. they're betting on, you know, our underwriting and they're betting on the fortitude of the company. And your business taking the, the delta between those two numbers? What, we are. Yeah. We are. Yeah. And you got to constantly manage that. Got to constantly. What's amazing to me is I knew pretty much nothing about credit and risk mm. starting this business. Now it's like p- big part of my world. <laughs> Does that make you look at the world differently? Do you get like somebody's like, "Hey, you want to go skydiving or go on a moped?" And you're just like, "No." <laughs> no, you, you you go to like you go to like Costco and you go, "God, you know, should I buy like you know seven thousand reams of paper?" And what's the interest expense associated with that? How long will it take me to use it? Absolutely. Like you look at everything. In terms of credit, I mean, it's yeah. really interesting, right? Yeah. I'll buy that and I'll have it for four years, but does it really turn out to be a good deal at the end of the day? I bought it really cheaply, but it actually cost me more money over time. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the climate in America today. We have uh, a group of people who feel uh, there's a lot of income inequality, entrepreneurship, still thriving in America. It's kind of our strength in the world. We also have a group of people who kind of feel like it's uh, we should ban the billionaires and maybe put caps on how much money people can make or tax the rich, et cetera. How do you, how do you think about America's future? Because now you're going global uh, in, in relation to entrepreneurship. Are you enthusiastic? Are you optimistic? Or are you concerned that the universal basic income socialist kind of undercurrent in America is going to head us in the wrong direction? Now, I wouldn't say that I'm concerned that it's going to head us in the wrong direction. I'm, I'm a big market force kind of guy, so I free I markets. believe that will yeah free markets that it'll it'll you know it will settle itself in a reasonable way. I believe entrepreneurship not only is here to stay, but it has to be here to stay. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's an essential part of uh, the you know fabric of of America. Uh, and critical. Uh, I also think that you know people who take that risk and go through the issues that that survey outlined, you know, should have an opportunity to to do well for putting that out. And by the way, do well for employing a lot of other people in the right. process. Right? That helps. Uh, Two thirds of all new jobs are originated by small businesses. Mm-hmm. That's a great thing. We need to keep doing that. Right. Yeah. See, I have this concern. We're going to disadvantage. We're we're we may start making potential entrepreneurs think about it twice. And as your survey says, it's hard to begin with. So if we disincentivize people and make them into the enemy for becoming entrepreneurs, this could have a really negative effect on them. No America. bueno. Not yeah, good. Not good. What do you think about Amazon getting chased out of New York? Um, I think it's a shame. Yeah. Um, I... Uh... You know, I, I think the tax base that that was going to create was like $30 billion for $3 billion. Now, whether that's a good deal or a bad deal, I, you know, I, look, I haven't done the, the math behind it, but... I, I could do the math for you, $27 billion 20, oh, plus 27 I was Math yeah. was never my thing. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but look, I think it's a shame. 
Um, those were 25,000 jobs. And granted, they might not have originated um, all from Long Island City. But guess what? I guarantee all the restaurants and dry cleaners oh, yes. and you know all the small businesses in and around Long Island City are like just saw that opportunity. We're so excited. Probably went out and bought a, you know, for the first time in their life, an expensive bottle of champagne. Yeah, here we and go. And then all of a sudden, they were like trying to spit it back in the bottle and return it. What do you think about Bezos just saying, you know what, I'm done. Takes his chessboard leaves. Just like, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> take, take, your, take your toys and go home. Yeah. Look, I, I wasn't privy to, to what was going on, yeah. but uh, obviously, but um, I understand you reach a breaking point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's important, I think, um, you know, he, he probably, you know, it w- might not have been him, but his team probably said, look, this is sort of the deal you cut. I'm a big believer. Once you cut a deal, yeah. you follow through with it. Why not? You sure. have to. Makes total um, because sense. Otherwise you're on, you know, what's the you're next company going to say? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. what happens is he goes, he moves forward and, you know, builds a, you know, you know, rents a bunch of space, does all these things and they go, we're actually going to change that one more time. Right. Um, and, you know, you can't, you can't run a business in that kind of an uncertain climate. What is this, Darth Vader and Lando Calrissian, uh, <laughs> like Cloud City? Pray that I don't alter the deal any further. It's like they literally made them redo the deal. And I, I am. Um, the, what people don't understand, I have to frame this correctly because I know I've got all the socialists who are going to clip this. What people don't understand is that jobs can move almost anywhere today. Yeah. And location, geography is not what it used to be. You have 500 employees or any of them outside the United States? Yeah. And 70 of them are 75. 75. Yeah. And maybe customer service, sales. I don't know. No, it's uh, we have data Dev analytics shop. and Perfect. we have a little bit of development. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure your team comes to you every week and says, or every month, hey, we, we could open an office here and save 50 cents on the dollar. Cost of living is two thirds, whatever it is. And you're in Atlanta, which is not the most expensive place in the world, but any company can move any job anywhere. If you're lucky enough and you're in a competition as a city, and if the taxes in New York, are greater than the taxes in Atlanta, and the taxes in Atlanta are greater than wherever in Texas, you're in a competition. So yep. cut a deal and get the jobs. If not, they're going to move it somewhere else. And by the way, you can move it to Canada. My, my hunch is... My hunch is... Ireland. Folks took a stand and didn't expect Amazon to walk away so quickly. Yeah. That's my guess. But... And, and by the way, I agree with you empl- about employment. I think the na- very nature, we think it's already like that. We mm-hmm. think that jobs can be anywhere. Right. Just wait. The next 10 years is going to be about- Bonkers. That's going to be the norm. It's not going to be the exception. It's it's so true. I mean, you think about it. We were sitting here 10 years ago. Matt Mullenweg was telling me about how WordPress was a virtual company. They had like one or two offices. And he was just going to put like regional co-working spaces and people could go to them. But he yeah. was going to hire people anywhere. And now, like the whole company's like that. There's a couple of companies at scale. I think Envision is another one, like mm-hmm. that are starting to hit scale with hundreds of employees and not much office space. Yeah. Like, what do you think is going to happen, New York? Like, if you make it untenable and you say we're going to ban the billionaires and you make you vil- I mean, it really got personal, like the vilifying Jeff Bezos. And Bezos has got to get it. A better yeah. idea of how to handle being the richest guy in the world. Like, it is a terrible look. I know. If he needs help, you know. I'm it's, there. Just, it's a it's a terrible look to be asking for handouts when you're the richest guy in the world or not doing charity. This is Bezos's two biggest mistakes. One, he bought a newspaper. When Bill Gates bought and partnered and did MSNBC, now he opened himself up because yeah. he had a news organization. You open yourself up when you're like all of a sudden doing news. And what did Bezos do? He did the he bought the Washington Post. You want to play that game? You now you're going to be a target. And he's done no philanthropy. He did like a tweet like about philanthropy. Like he needs to go give a billion dollars every six months to something so that people realize he's not just accumulating hundreds of billions of dollars in personal wealth and not splashy cashing it. Like yeah, yeah. he could have easily won New York. Very simple. We're gonna give a billion dollar I'm gonna personally give a billion dollars to the New York City school system over the next yeah. twenty years. Cost him nothing. It's a tax write-off. Go do it. Yeah. This is a message to Jeff Bezos. There you go. I'll talk to AOC and Jeff Bezos later. Uh, hey, listen, thanks for doing it. I know you're busy. I know you got the big uh, unicorn company. Congratulations on that. And thanks, Jackie, who has now, we're, this is our you know 10th year. We're trying to do all unicorns. 
Wow. So we had... Fortunately, you know, big funds have made a lot of unicorns recently. Uh, and big revenue at those unicorns have yeah. made a lot of unicorns. There we, go. What do we got? Roger McNamee's coming on. He's been associated with a bunch of unicorns. Uh, you. Uh, we had Katarina, who was on the board of Etsy and Kickstarter unicorns. Uh, Keith Raboy, tons of unicorns, PayPal, et cetera. So we're just, we're lining up all the unicorn founders for the f next 100 episodes. Startups, if you uh, need a little cabbage, you know what to do, go to cabbage. You can spell it with a C, you can spell it with a K, um, and uh, you can get money in six minutes if you authenticate your account. Continued success, Rob. Thanks for coming on the pod. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, it. we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>